welcome to the Quantified Health Wellness and Aging Podcast. A podcast about the latest products and services, technologies and people pushing forward a new frontier. Bi-monthly Lee S. Dryber hosts a pioneer for an in-depth discussion. And now over to the show. Hello and welcome to the 12th episode of the Quantified Health, Wellness and Aging Podcast. On today's show, we have Jeff Kadeetz. Jeff is a serial entrepreneur and angel investor who has helped drive a wide range of technologies and businesses. His fields of exploration have included rockets, anti-ICBM technologies, consumer electronics, mobile gaming, finance, lemonade stands, network security, and biotechnology. He founded a firm, a fintech company, which focuses on bringing transparency to consumer lending, prior to which he served as chief data and analytics officer at mobile gaming giant NG Moco. In 2015, Jeff founded QBio, a healthcare startup dedicated to reinventing healthcare from scratch. Jeff has degrees in quantum physics and computer science from Carnegie Mellon University. He resides and skis in Wilson, Wyoming. Welcome to the show, Jeff. Hi, Lee. How are you doing? Well, <laughs> do you have 20 minutes? I'm. Uh, this is meant to be a one in a hundred year event taking place at the moment. I don't mean this podcast. I mean this uh, pandemic. And let's just put it this way. I actually went to bed last night, knew we had a podcast today, and then I only remembered when the alarm for it went one hour ago and that was because somehow my mind went back to yesterday and i i got the days mixed up i've been rolling out of bed straight into looking at coronavirus uh, covid19 and working way later than i normally do and going back to bed on it again so it's been tough you it's been um I'm a little bit. I've been isolated for the last few weeks in in, uh, in the Tetons in Wyoming, so it's all feels like a little bit like watching a science fiction movie play out. It's 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 terrifying and it's fascinating at the same time. In the last few days, I've been going from well, it first hit me um, a week ago last Tuesday when a friend texted me and said, "Hey, a group of her friends have." have it. And I'm in a country um, border in northern Italy. And when I heard the details of some people in the group in their 20s, like struggling to breathe, losing consciousness, uh, finding it hell, a head that feels it's going to explode, labored breathing. I'm like, damn, that doesn't sound like flu to me. And yeah, just the last thing I'd remembered was seeing Trump on TV saying, hey, it's a flu and there's 15 cases in my April, it'll be gone. So that night I started looking and then I was like, hang on, this looks back at the envelope calculations like you're going to have half a million to 1.2 million dead in the States alone. And then I calculated the shortness of ventilators, beds, and I was just perplexed at the disparity between my calculations and television. And I, I just went on it full time. And now, 10 days later, over 10 days later, um, I, I swing between uh, a panic and uh, a relaxedness. And it, what, what doesn't help, because it depends where you put the maths. I've eventually got the maths together to know why there's such a wide variation. But even then, it's quite extreme because you have like Elon Musk now, you know, saying, hey, no need for panic, be calm, it, it's indicating it's not such a big thing. And then you've got David Sinclair, um, Mark Hyman, and others backed with the kind of figures I had. But luckily, in the last few hours, I'm back to, I would say, a 0.6 case fatality rate, which is way better than the one, two, three I had 10 days ago. But there is just so much surrounding this, and it's an economic toll also. It's not just a human toll. When I look at the economic toll, that's harder to begin to work out. Because, you know, it depends upon the human toll. But we're not going back to life the way it was in any case. No, I, I think that's one of the – I think about that a lot. And um, one of the interesting things when, what I've been thinking about is, you know, I, in, I've been kind of reading more and more about the flu, the, the Spanish flu in 1918. And I've wondered how, 
you know, the world is much smaller now. Uh, and, you know, there's a lot more information and information travels a lot faster than it used to then. And I'm wondering if there were short-lived cultural changes that happened after um, 1918 that eventually um, were lost because we didn't have the internet, which is in some sense a, a backup of society's memory. And, uh, and I'm wondering if there's going to be changes that are much longer lived now simply because, you know, in 20 years people are going to go search and see the panic that was caused in videos and, and news from, from today, whereas 20 years after 1918, that was, could have easily been lost um, if you were born after it. And, and so it's, it's, it's interesting to see, I'm interested to see how sticky some of these changes are and if the internet has any effect on that. Yeah, and I notice, I, I, I could never have imagined how quick society can change. I went to the supermarket yesterday and I'm designated a time because earlier is for the elderly. And then around the supermarket aisles, people are scared of each other and not looking forward to meeting another in passing and trying to force a meter uh, between them. And, and then there's barriers up at the cash registers and, you know, the clerks have masks on. But then as a, a, the funny thing was we all avoided each other going around the supermarket. But then when we got to pay, there was only one cashier on, one checkout. So, so people didn't know what to do. Because if you didn't step forward and crunch against the next person, well, somebody would step in front of you who didn't care. So you would never get served. So it became this petri issue. People just crammed together. And it was just ridiculous how much we avoided each other, went according to a schedule, and then got smashed together, waiting ages on a queue. It's a bit like when Donald Trump uh, began saying that, hey, the flights from Europe are going to be canceled. And then there was panic at the airports, and it was six hours to get your bags and up to two hours to clear. So people were waiting eight to ten hours, I'm told, cramped together. So it's very hard to make sense, to do sense-making at the moment. And with the job I do, I, I, I spend my life making sense or attempting to make sense and this has just thrown a, a curveball into it that I'm not appreciating because life was quite good the way I had it. You know, I thought I had the vectors worked out. So, yeah. And I don't think any of the, the clients I serve, they're going to go back to business as usual. And what's kind of disappointing me is I still am seeing these messaging and streams and announcements that probably were pre-buffered on social media, but it doesn't fit the zeitgeist. It doesn't fit the time. I don't want to know about your smartwatch that can detect if I'm falling in love or <laughs> have glowing skin at the moment. This is not where, where attention is, and I don't think it's going to be here uh, when we come back. I, I think something has fundamentally changed, and it, how big a change is going to depend upon the economic aftershocks. But before the huge economic aftershocks, you know, we've got this toll over the next couple of months where, yeah, let's say half the American population is, is likely to get it. But we don't even know what, how much of the population has it at the moment. That's what's throwing the maths off by, by so many factors. Yeah, I, I think that, that's – and I think that's the um, – a lot of the source of, of panic is just – the uncertainty and you know, and not having in that information. Um, clearly, you know, if you look at the numbers from South Korea or at least what's reported, it's they were so aggressive so early. They have the information. They can make decisions based on the information. And we're in a situation where we don't have the information. So everybody's you know, we have to take the kind of the most dire precautions because lack of information is um, is what's driving that. I did see that Everly Well had announced a home test, but the PCR kind, you know, it's, it's, a little, it's uncomfortable where you need to uh, swab right the back of your nose and then you need to use a postal service. But I saw uh, another company, I tweeted it on Hyperwellbeing, I, f I forget the name, and uh, if they're FDA approved, then it'll be uh, at home testing uh, without needing to uh, insert things to the back of your nose and use the, the postal system because you want to get tested, not because you, you, you have symptoms, but to know if it has passed you by. For example, a month ago, my girlfriend and I were like, this is a really weird flu we've got. 
We were both perplexed by it. We didn't even think of coronavirus. Four days later, like the same flu back again, just a bizarre flu. And even now I'm like, I don't know. It was just kind of odd. And everybody kind of seems sick, but you don't know if that is regular influenza. We didn't have coughing or high fever, but but you want to know if you've had it to know if you've got antibodies. So, uh, and now, like without uh, the like South Korea, as you mentioned, they 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 were on top of it more than anyone else. And if you take their data, then you have a case fatality rate of zero point six, which is good. But it's still diabolical if you assume half of California will get it in the following two months. And yeah. So we have to hope that the case fatality is actually zero point two. But you see, like the Lancet report and so on, uh, putting out huge numbers. You saw the WHO putting out uh, like something in the one to three percent range. I'll, I'll put these links in the, in the show notes. And I got frustrated checking online at the stats. Because I know in Slovenia, the stats are higher. So I, 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 I don't see how we can go about business for the next two months, Jeff. It's just look at the exponential growth rate. The good news is it'll have an exponential decline because, you know, you only meet the same, roughly the same people each day, you know, in your family units and circles. It's, and, and you run into people who have been pre-infected. So it has an exponential decline on the other side and we should be good by August. But the next few months, I, I don't know how you go about business. And I don't know how you get mess- uh, any business messaging out that people will listen to over the next two months. Well, I think, well, there's, I think there's a question of reinfection rate and like immunity. I think there's a lot of, a lot of it, it seems like unless we have a really solid treatment or a very clear vaccine, which like it, there, it really, we won't be behind this until one of those things happen. There are prom- a couple promising off-label drugs, so they're now uh, off-patent. And in fact, Elon Musk has been uh, tweeting about them that do look promising. In terms of a vaccine, I was on the uh, 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 the phone to a CEO uh, of a company, I, I won't name it, and he said they have a vaccine. They just need it approved. And I said, hey, but what about the cytokine storm? That was never solved for MERS and SARS. He said, no, we've solved it. I'll say it was an Israeli um, venture. In terms of uh, coronavirus, how do you see it impacting your business? I know you're in the midst of it, but surely you must instantly notice that, hey, look, people are probably not really attuned to hearing about a wellness package at the moment, I, I would presume. It actually hasn't affected us too much. I think the biggest thing we've been focusing on is making sure we um, update and, and kind of double check and triple check our, our procedures for making sure that um, as people come through, everything is sterilized. But I think given, you know, if in some ways I could imagine given our initial customer base, this, uh, you, you can imagine increasing the demand for, for, for people who want more visibility and understanding of what's going on in their bodies. Please, for the sake of the audience, could you give an introduction to QBio? Yeah. So I think, you know, we're trying to kind of step back and, and, and start from first principles and think about how would you design a primary care system um, with the technology and knowing what we know now, if you could do it from scratch. And when we, when we did that, one of the first things we f- felt was important is that if you want to have value-based care or you know, be making data-driven decisions in healthcare, there's a fundamental capability that's missing, which is more or less you need to have some kind of analytics platform for measuring change in the human body. And, and this is very important, I think, because I think we, you know, if you look at the way diagnostics have been done historically, um, there's some fundamental assumptions about statistical distributions, that specifically that human health is roughly a normal distribution. And I think it's actually much more of a long tail distribution. And so the idea that I can take a population reference or that was typically actually, you know, done by taking a thousand white males and they're probably middle-aged and establishing that as a reference and then applying that to everyone and to determine whether or not they have some biomarker that's high or low, or if they are at high risk for a single disease. It's silly because we all have unique genetics and even people who have the same genetics, like twins, diverge over time. 
So that that's one reason I think it's 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 somewhat flawed. But but the other is is really that um, what's more much more likely to be common is the rate of changes across people when they're developing a disease versus the absolute measurement at a single point in time of a specific biomarker. I think it's also a little bit crazy that we try and reduce complicated diseases like cardiovascular disease to a single variable measured at a single point in time based on one of these population references. Um, of course, our diagnostics have terrible specificity, right? In what other, uh, you know, in what uh, in this era, what other business, what, what business can you think of? Can you imagine if Facebook tried to predict uh, which ads you were going to click on or how to customize your, new, your news feed based on a single variable? Or if Google gave you search results based on a single variable to predict relevance, uh, uh, you know, like th- that would never happen. Um, and so the idea of using multivariate information about the human body and then how those things are changing is really just applying kind of modern information theory and data science to understanding human health. And so going back to where we started, we said, okay, well, what that means is if we want to be able to build this analytics platform for the body, there's a few things that are required. We need to cover the major, the most salient features of the body. What is that? That's genetic information, chemical information, and structural information, right? It needs to be non-invasive. It needs to be fast, and we need to be able to make it cheap. The last thing that's very important is it needs to be reproducible. The set of measurements that we take needs to be reproducible. And the reason that's critical is if it's not reproducible, if I can't reproducibly measure a quantity, right, that's in, under experimental control, I can't measure what's changing in it. And I think there's a, there's a ton of information that's actually collected in the healthcare system today that isn't that is subjective observation, or there's even lab tests that are not as reproducible as you'd like if you come from a background, let's say, in experimental physics. So, you know, like I said, these, these properties of, um, you know, are, are very important. It's non-invasive, cheap, fast, and reproducible. And if you can do that, if you can make this, you can kind of think of this as a physical of the future, where if I can gather genetic, chemical, and structural information in a way that has these four properties, I can then actually track what's changing, right? And, and, that, and there's all kinds of, um, you know, benefits to this. Specifically, it sets up us to build a healthcare system that actually gets better and more efficient over time, right? Because like you can't make data decisions, you can't op- do be self-optimizing, right? Unless you are understanding how your interventions affect a system. And that's true in a single individual, and it's also true at a population level. And that's why this, you know, this isn't really a revolutionary idea. I mean, measuring changes in a system to be able to forecast future measurements in that system is effectively the scientific method to some degree, right? Like if we look at almost every modern, uh, you know, scientific discipline, they were all revolutionized when an instrument was developed or instruments that allowed us to cheaply measure the system that was being studied, right? Astronomy was revolutionized by the telescope. Uh, Biology was um, revolutionized by the microscope. Like weather was revolutionized by the thermometer, Right. And then we have all these other sensors now, but at the end of the day, you know, what, what, what ends up happening when we want to take something that is an art or a kind of a a soft science and make it a a, a hard science is really the transformation of it becoming an information science, right? Because when we can reproducibly measure a system and then we can go back, you know, after we gather that data and develop algorithms that try and predict the next measurement, well, if, it doesn't agree. We say, okay, our models don't actually describe the dynamics of the system. We have to come up with a new model. But if it starts to agree, we start to think, oh, hey, we understand actually the dynamics of the system. We can forecast changes to the system. We can test hypotheticals. And I actually think ultimately that's where we're going to get to with the human body. And if you, if you kind of take what we're proposing out into the future, we'll get to a point where we have this virtual kind of model of each one of our health that we can test hypotheticals for. And this, I think this could be a boon for not only personalized diagnostics, but personalized therapeutics. That was very eloquent. We should be applying systems theory to healthcare as a system. As in, you need to measure every component and see how it affects the totality recursively. 
Well, I think, you know, every, you know, there's, 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 there's every, and then there's every, right. I think initially as we're learning, um, if we can measure things reproducibly cheaply, um, and, um, you know, quickly and non-invasively, then it makes sense to measure more. But I actually think that what ends up happening, um, and this is a little bit like indexing a web page, right? I actually think of the platform for healthcare in the future is a lot like a search engine for your body. And the physical is like indexing a web page, right? It's like a web crawler. A web crawler doesn't actually copy a whole web page. It actually extracts the most salient features. And depending on the web page, some features might be more salient than others. And I actually think it's going to be the same way for people eventually. I think eventually the physical that we get in order to optimize for outcomes and cost will be tailored to our individual risks and previous measurements that were taken. So you can imagine you show up to a place, probably it's almost going to be, I think would imagine like a car wash for your body. You go in, you say, hey, I'm here for my checkup. Might have been a year ago. It might have been a few months ago, depending on your risks. But the set of measurements that are taken are quickly computed and saying, here's the optimal set of measurements that we take to understand and forecast Jeff's health risks for the next year and help us determine if he needs to see a doctor or he doesn't and he should just come back next year. And if you think about the efficiencies that would be gained, you can almost think of this as a triage layer in front of the existing primary care system. Because one thing that is common across the entire globe is that the number of doctors per capita is going down. And all the attempts to say AI this, AI that are really attempts to displace highly skilled labor or effectively doctor's time. And I don't think that's going to happen soon. And I actually think we have enough doctors. So the problem isn't we doctors need to spend more time with patients. It's that doctors need to make sure they're spending time with the patients that need it. And so how would we effectively, I would think of this system that I'm suggesting that is a triage system is actually being like a load balancer for highly skilled labor in the primary care system, right? If we can, we don't have to automatically determine if you're sick. We just have to automatically determine if you need to see a doctor, right? And that's very different uh, because if you can... It, scan a thousand people by these comprehensive uh, set of metrics and only a thousand of them need to talk to a doctor that year, effectively that doctor is caring for 10,000 people, right? And I think that's the way to think about the gains that one of the major gains in efficiency is it's a better use of highly skilled labor in a time when we have an increasingly scarce amount of that labor. Brad Perkins, the first guest I ever had, he said, the he believes the future healthcare will require a new breed of clinicians, more data scientists. There, they would be more akin to being data scientists. Would Would you agree with that? Uh, no, actually, I wouldn't. I think that that would. I think that's the equivalent of saying, you know, that's like saying, um, look, Google didn't get rid of the need for you know. I, I think of. I think it's a fundamental transformation. Right. Like it's, if the internet, when the internet came available, it was like the world's largest library. The, we didn't need new people using the internet. We needed new tools to help us find what we were looking for in the library. Right. Cause the Dewey decimal system wasn't going to work for the internet. Right? But it just scale. With, with traditional um, clinicians have the training. Well, I don't, I think if we give, I think with the right tools, they don't need training. I think that's, I mean, I think, and that's part of the, one of the, I think, elegant things about what Google does. You don't need to be taught how to use Google very much. Like you just ask a question. You say, this is what I'm looking for. And you get better at using it and it gets better at answering your questions. I actually think that it, the amount of information that we're talking about in the healthcare system um, and how it's going up is, like, that's exactly why I actually think the ultimate clinical decision support to the future, not only for population health management, but for individual patient care is going to be a search engine. As a doctor, I should just be able to go to uh, you know, my Jeff's dashboard and I should say, hey, tell me about Jeff's respiratory system. And the system should just summarize all the most relevant information about Jeff's respiratory system for me. Like I think I, I don't think I think it needs new we need new tools to help doctors sift through this information and find the most relevant bits based on uh, the questions that they have. We don't need necessarily new doctors. There might be uh, a new set of, I think there could be the same way that there are data scientists and their analysts. I, I think that there could be um, the people that build these tools might very well be people that have, you know, 
medical or biological backgrounds um, and computer science backgrounds. But fundamentally, ultimately, what technology should do is not require more, uh, you know, a data science background from a doctor. What it really should do is liberate the doctor to actually just focus on making clinical decisions and care of a person, right? Technology should uh, minimize the technical requirements for a doctor or technical background, not enhance it. I don't know if you saw my uh, statement I made, which was the future I, I see is computer science moving to health and wellness, which is a converse of the trend that most people seem to be focused on with digital health and so on, which is digitization of present healthcare. Would you agree? I mean, this might, I don't know if this is too philosophical, but in general, I think what we're going to see is, you know, this is, there's very big venture capital companies that are built on the idea that software is eating the world, right? And I don't, and I think that fundamentally, you know, that's going to be true for everything. Like information, you can call it computer science, like, you know, uh, having a degree in computer science, I think that there's two parts to what is traditionally called computer science. There's information theory and then there's programming. Computer science is actually, in my mind, more information theory than it is programming. It's just like kind of the, the tools that we use to study information. But I think that's just, that's true everywhere. And I think that there's, especially as we start to get into quantum information systems, the line between information and physical reality is going to continue to get blurry. And that's why software can eat the world. I saw back in 20, 2005, uh, especially when it hit the end of 2007, and then with the release, release of the iPhone, I said that a computer manufacturer, um, Apple, and a search engine company, Google, will encroach the telecom space. Now, telecoms was a hardware industry, which had been my industry, and people were laughing. Now, it is, it's fairly obvious that te te telecoms a... a software eight telecoms. And I don't think the software and internet has actually had much impact on, upon healthcare. And if you agree with that premise, then surely you would agree that software and the internet or networking has not hit healthcare. And when it does hit healthcare, you're not left with the same healthcare afterwards. I, I would I would agree. And I think that there's in and in, in some ways there's there's good um, there's good reason for it. Like there's there's a lot of dogma in healthcare, right? Like, I mean, just think about the the kind of quote unquote annual checkup of the physical. There's almost nothing that a doctor does when you go visit them that couldn't have been done over 200 years ago in terms of the information, right? Um, sometimes there are labs, but there's a lot of times they don't even do that, right? So I think, you know, that's that's a long time to have very little change, right? I but I also think that you know there is a uh, and it's, I think it's especially bad in the United States. I think there is in some ways a doctors have to operate in a constant state of fear, right? This the do no harm thing is really I think a a fear and the, and honestly the liability issues in some in the United States I think actually exacerbate this. There is a kind of an unreasonable standard that doctors have. To you know, if people come to somebody and say, "Am I sick or not?" It's almost never that binary, right? It's never that black and white. It's sick or not. It's well, here's the statistics, right? And but a lot of everybody understands that. So doctors are in a very tough decision to give people kind of absolute certainty when that really is not something that exists. And I think because of that, right, any change that they make to us, like what is they were clinically taught actually puts them at risk of like losing their ability to practice right medicine. But, and so the funny thing about um, all this is, so it's it, it just because of that, you know, healthcare was not ever designed. It's, 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 it's very heavily regulated for good reason because people's lives are at risk, but that really does slow down change. And if you want something to get better and cheaper, that requires fundamentally change. You need to have a system that, can introspect itself, learn from mistakes, um, and then improve. But healthcare is not really set up to do that with, for, for a number of reasons. And I think there is a very delicate challenge in trying to figure out how you, um, and that's something that we think a lot about, is how do you create more opportunities for self-optimization and learning um, without creating increased risks to the individuals, right? 
because at the end of the day, I would, I would almost argue that clinical studies are just as an idea are somewhat flawed, right? Like one thing that I was talking about earlier is that I don't think human health is really a normal distribution. I think it's a long tail. What even makes it more complicated is I would argue that it's based on non-stationary patterns, right? Which means that what it means to be sick and healthy is changing depending on, you know, the environment, um, technology, what we eat, our behaviors. Just take the average age, height and weight of a baby 50 years ago and apply it. If you apply that today, every baby is like in the 90 somethingth percentile. So our nutrition is getting better. So that means that just the idea of doing these like long, like the problem with like these fixed in time studies and then applying it forever into the future to me is fundamentally flawed. What we really need to do is take the approach of how do we measure more about all of us and continually learn and update the system from everything we know? Because in theory, the more people that have lived, the better we should be at understanding what's going on in our bodies, right? And, yeah, and each and, life that lives and dies makes a contribution well, by having lived. And I so would argue that that should every be life is meaningful, right? And because the, the amazing, because you know, I, I, uh, about four or five years ago, I gave a podcast and I talked about how the first thing that would be useful, and I, I think there's a lot of missing information in the existing healthcare system because it is mostly subjective information versus kind of objective measurements about our biology, is data donorship. If people if people could go to the DMV and opt to be a data donor instead of just an organ donor, the power of that is you have the, if you donate kind of the history or the evolution of your biology and, and how it changed over your life, it can benefit every person that's ever going to be born after you. Whereas if I donate an organ, I could save one or two people's life maybe. And so I fully agree. And especially- there's a compounding effect. And especially, I, I mentioned this with uh, Nathan Price, that my father uh, suffered cancer many times and ultimately uh, died from it. And it Sorry. was such a shame. I, I appreciate that. It's such a shame that he wasn't able to donate that data pre-chemo, post-chemo, chemo again, no chemo, and so forth. You know, there was no recording of those variables and their interrelations and their changes over time as his life underwent those changes and then ultimately uh, led to a, a final um, uh, decline. I mean, that brings up another, I think, another great thing is like a lot of that I wanted to say about this approach of let's take a step back and how do we build an analytics platform for the body that can measure what's changing? This isn't really, this isn't just about potentially understanding changes that are the precursors to serious disease. There's a whole bunch of host of other scenarios where having understanding and measuring these changes are valuable, right? If before, if you uh, ever have been injured or have a serious tr like traumatic orthopedic injury, if a doctor or a set of doctors, surgeons has a understanding of what your anatomy and chemistry were like before they do surgery, they have a better chance of actually measuring if they restored you to your, how, how close they got to restoring you to your, you know, pre-injury status, right? And that's not just actually an anatomically, that's potentially chemically because, you know, I've had a number of orthopedic surgeries where I know that my inflammation in my body has gone up because of, you know, severely damaged kind of joints. And so there's chemical information after surgery, not just anatomical. You can imagine being rushed. I have a, like recently, uh, my girlfriend's brother was rushed to the hospital after falling in a ski accident. Um, and he, when he stood up, it wasn't a very bad fall, but when he stood up, he had like severe abdominal pains. They rushed him to the hospital and they did a full TC scan. They found that he had an enlarged spleen. They assumed that he might be going into sepsis. They cut him open from his sternum to his belly button, untangled his intestines, looking for holes, didn't find anything, closed him back up. He was in, the, in and out of the hospital for two months, all kinds of complications, hundreds of thousands of dollars in medical bills. And it turns out he just has a slightly larger than average spleen, right? It was, it was <laughs> so, so my, one of my, so like not doctors, not being able to see like what has changed recently in a person forces them to conclude that when you're symptomatic or have an issue and time is of the essence, that your latest symptoms are correlated to anything like anything that is that they think is abnormal. The problem is that if you believe in this long tail and everybody's a little bit different, there is no normal. 
right? Doctors, you know, in medical school, they're showing here's a female anatomy, here's a male anatomy. And if it deviates from that a little bit, especially in an emergency, you know, they have to, they have to be safe. You know, you hear doctors talk about I operated because I, well, I had to be sure. Well, another way they could be sure is just to see that nothing had changed since this horrible accident and know that, no, you just have a slightly larger, uh, larger than average spleen. You didn't, you know, this wasn't because, you know, you have a leak in your intestine. So I have to ask the question, why was this not possible before? Why is it suddenly possible now? Well, let me, let me answer that in one, se- in one second, because I think there's another, like, this is a specific kind of information. I'm talking about surgical. Another reason I think it's very important to measure change is how many times in the current healthcare system are people prescribed drugs for the rest of their life based on a sim- single lab result, right? I, I'm, I'm very, like, I don't think we have good information on this, but I'm really interested in knowing how do we know when we get prescribed one of these drugs that it's not only it's having the effect that it was intended, but it's not having other effects. And the reason this is particularly important and why if it was standard that we took these snapshots about people on an annual basis and we could understand this better is that drug developers, when they develop drugs, and I learned this um, not too long ago, if they, if they develop a drug, a statin that's just supposed to adjust your cholesterol, when they do the clinical study to see how the, the drug works, what they do is they only measure your cholesterol. And there's a really interesting reason why. It's because they don't want to know what else it's changing because if they find that it changes other things and has measurable side effects, they would have to report it. That's very scary to me, right? Because that makes me want to know every time I get prescribed something, I don't just want to know it's doing what it's supposed to. I want to make sure it's not doing things that it's not supposed to. And so I think that's another specific use case of just the simple ability of measuring what's changing, right? Over time allows doctors to actually... You know, just like we do A-B testing on websites and apps, it's like, why can't a doctor actually measure the impact that of an intervention they're having, whether it's drugs, you know, exercise, whatever they're prescribing, surgery, why don't they have the tools to measure the impact that they're having? Why is it they just prescribe something and assume it's fixed if you don't complain? I, I hear the, the logic. I'm get, 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 you know, Getting back to your question about why wasn't this possible, there's a few, I think... There's a lot of things that have happened in the last decade, but to me, the thing that I started paying attention to is, and I think this is the general trend, is I would say we're entering the age of the digitization of biology, right? And what, and to me, what that really means is you can look at all these different technologies that we're developing and the trend really, whether it's genomics, transcriptomics, proteomics, epigenetics, metabolomics, microbiomics, you know, then there's kind of... Uh, you can call it radiomics if you want to talk about this morphology. The general trend in most of these kind of areas is that the price of measuring one thing is approaching the price of measuring everything, right? Like, like early on, you know, you know, you even look at 23 and me, they looked at a few SNPs. Now the cost of transporting a sample to a lab is a dominant, is a, is a, is a dominant cost for like a shallow whole genome sequence. Um, and so you might as well sequence the whole thing if you're going to take the sample to the lab. And I think that, you know, shotgun metabolomics, shotgun proteomics, all these things, they're not, they're not there yet, but what they have in common is the approach to gathering information is measure everything in the sample, then use software to ask questions. Whereas assays historically were, let's find a reagent that interacts with some chemical that, or some protein that we want to measure, then we use some sensor based on whether it's some kind of light it maybe gives off to, and the intensity of that light tells us kind of the concentration. So the assays before were actually, the query was baked into the assay, right? In a digitization, right, you're actually taking a physical object and extracting all the information in it so you can ask questions later. And that's, so the query becomes software, not the actual physical process of gathering information. And that is the trend that's allowing us to start to do this. And I think that, you know, because as the, you know, in, in a lot of these areas, if you look at genetics, for example, and that's just the tip of the iceberg, you know, it's price performance has beaten Moore's law in the last decade or so, right? And so I think that's going to continue in all the kinds of things that we can measure about the human body. And so it's very clear, you can kind of look on the horizon and say, well, at some point, it's going to be feasible and cheap to just measure everything about the human body on some regular interval. And when that happens, healthcare will truly become a pure information science. It logically stacks up 
and you would imagine it would have to happen because it logically stacks up. Everything stacks against it not happening. I, yeah, I think it was, you know, we, to me, it's an inevitability. It's a matter of, you know, assuming human civilization exists, at least. Um, and I think it will be, at some point, it'll be a necessity. But I think, I think it's a matter of when, not if, to be perfectly honest. Yeah, I, I, I don't think I could agree with uh, you anymore. And it's because I very much agree with your um, train of thoughts. It's why I put my life on hold in 2015 to, to focus on, um, on what I do focus on, which very much uh, is in accordance with what you say. But the road there may be complicated. And that takes me back to what I was going to ask you was each chronic disease is approximately a trillion dollar industry. And so there's a lot of entrenched positions. So, for example, you mentioned um, that you dispense statins based off um, some cholesterol measures. And by the way, cholesterol is very dynamic. It changes roughly sure. every four days. Yeah, I can change the profiles and the subbands of it through diet alone, which is kind of shocking. You wonder why people get dispensed drugs on a test once a year. The amount of stress, if I recently had an infection, it's also different. It's a, it's a dynamic system. And actually, I perform a lot better with high cholesterol. And my other markers are better with high cholesterol. I just make sure it's not damaged cholesterol. So maybe I'm a, you might consider myself cynical here, but I, I don't think this is, I don't take the position it's cynical. Doctors have been coerced um, for a, unknowingly, I would say, it's became a collective thing, into using stupid markers simply to dispense drugs. You know, if the cholesterol is this, I put you, put you on a statin without much investigation. So don't you see that healthcare today has incentives just to dispense drugs and there's, they don't actually want to do any real testing? There, there is, but I, this goes back to, I don't blame doctors, to be perfectly honest. I think that there's a matter of liability. I think there's this problem of doctors not wanting to ever go outside of, like it's, it's you know, that saying no one ever got fired for buying IBM, which might not be true anymore, but it, I, swear, I think I heard it when I was We, we know what it means. Yeah. <laughs> um, but I think it's it's a similar thing. Like, would you risk your livelihood on um, something, uh, you know, that would, you know, and you know, that wasn't widely accepted? Like, if a doctor goes based on a massively ex widely accepted clinical study of here's best practices, they're not risking anything, and and who who can blame them? But you know, I think there's a bigger question here, which I think you kind of brought up. It's that until we have the ability to comprehensively measure changes in the human body. So that we can actually study the impact of certain things and how um, the, whether the how in biomarkers are related, and, and I should I should also add that if you want to do this, you also need to make this measuring process fast, right? Because when people say, "Oh, I went and got this measured yesterday, and next week I'm going to get this measured," and say, "Oh, I, I measure everything once a year," I don't think that's the same. Because again, going back to it with the background in experimental physics, it's if I want to characterize a system at a point in time. I need to take a snapshot of it. Otherwise, I lose the ability to correlate the relationships between those measurements, which is part of the thing that gives me the power of prediction, right? And so, you know, I, I have to say that most clinical things that I read, I, I, because of um, we don't have the tools right now to study the human body the way we would most other physical systems, I'm not sure how, how like, I, I don't, I have a hard time relying on them too much. And I think that almost I would I would go as far on a limb as that most of medical knowledge that we have today is probably incorrect and it's probably heavily biased. And and I don't again I don't think that's anybody's fault. I just think it's, but I think there's a lot of evidence in it. Like we look at a clinical study and how hard it is to reproduce the results of a clinical study, right? Or if we you know or just look at how quickly a decade ago we'll believe one thing is the problem and then a decade later it's another thing like. It's just not that systematic, right? And again, and, and I think can go into all these reasons why I think that's true. But there's just, I think, overwhelming evidence that we just know a lot less than we think we do. I more than fully concur. I know that is the case. So I think, that, I think, I think our approach really, I, I mean, I think fundamentally, if you come at our approach to the solving this problem um, from a scientific perspective, it's say, let's just assume we know nothing. 
right? Let's start from that. We have the tools, and, and I'm not saying uh, you know we should completely act that way, but we should, in some ways, um, you know, be a little have a little bit more humility about our you know our ability to understand the human body. Like we understand almost every part of our universe better than we understand what's going on in our own bodies and oceans. <laughs> yeah, well, another very complex dynamic system, and and and, and, um, and I think and I think our approach is really just to be a little bit humble and saying, look. We don't really know. We have some ideas, but why not approach this in a way that we can have a lot more confidence in what we do and what we don't know? And, and you know, one of my co-founders is, does a lot of research, Mike Snyder, Dr. Mike Snyder, the chair of genetics at Stanford. And, and you know, and there's a lot of evidence that even just like type, type, type 2 diabetes is actually a lots of different diseases. You know, we, we lump these things together into this ontology, but, you know, we really haven't had the tools to measure and study um, you know, human metabolism at, at, at the way you would, would if you, as a true scientist, um, enough to understand these things. And, and I don't think, um, and I think that we should just be, I think our approach is really to be a little bit more humble and say, Hey, let's, what is the way, if we want to actually start pinning things down, how would you approach this? And it's the same with Alzheimer's. It's not one disease. And you see the, um, because of the dogma of uh, amyloid plaques, you see the situation we now are in with Alzheimer's where it's predicted that continuing the way we are, that half of all millennials will end up with uh, such a degenerative uh, cognitive decline. Yeah, I, I think, I mean, I'm, this is where um, the way, you know, again, going back to my background in physics is the amyloid plaques to some degree are, are a macroscopic phenomena, right? Like if you can, because especially if you can see it's something like MRI at a millimeter resolution. Processes that lead to that, you know, are happening on a billionth or a millionth of a meter. And so part of this idea of let's measure more about the body isn't just like measure more. Let's, let's take multi-scale measurements, right? Like in most, uh, in a lot of physics, you want to understand things happening at different length and different time scales. I think we need to apply that same kind of thinking to the body, right? We can measure things about our chemistry on the billionth of a meter. We can measure things about cellular organization, which is a millionth of a meter. We can measure things about the structure of our body on the, on the thousandth of a meter. But it's correlating across all these different length scales that actually helps us understand processes, right? Because just the way, because of the way the human body is built, if I can see something happening at a millimeter scale, it means that there's a lot of things that have to be happening at a billionth or a millionth of a meter scale. And so I don't even necessarily need to, so it's triangulating between all these things that can actually really help us understand processes. And if you think of, and, and if you, once you understand that, you can say, okay, well, there's lots of different processes that could be happening at a millionth of a, or a billionth of a meter that could look the same at a thousandth of a meter. And I think that's, again, going back to why something like uh, Alzheimer's could look, could actually be the result of many different underlying physical processes that are going awry. But we think of it as one disease because at a macroscopic level, that's what it looks like. Talking physically, do you subscribe to the notion if you keep the mitochondria healthy, you keep the tissue healthy, you keep the tissue healthy, you keep the organs healthy, you keep the organs healthy, you keep the body healthy? My, you know, I, I don't have formal, I've read a lot about biology, but I, I, um, I have, I don't like to speculate too much on, on microbiology because of that. I will say that Again, going back to kind of the fundamental, and, and I think of you know physics obviously underpins a lot of the chemistry and, and you know ultimately what happens in biology. But you know I do think that the human body fundamentally, or maybe it's just a property of life, is an entropy fighting system. And the act of aging, in my mind, is just the like when our body slows down its replication and lose the ability to keep up with entropy. Um, and so I see no reason. I, I so I see no reason. That, you know, let's say we, if we had unlimited energy, I see no reason why we shouldn't be able to stay as young as we want indefinitely because it really is just a matter of being able to combat entropy. Um, and, and so whether or not, you know, that entropy is the majority of the entropy is accumulating in a mitochondria or something else. At the end of the day, it's just managing disorder. We are constantly battling, you know, our body's desire to be pulled into disorder but given enough energy, we should be able to keep its order. Are you aware of David Sinclair's information theory of aging? No, but I know David. I sat on a panel with David, and I liked, and, and, I, and I'm a big fan of him. And, um, and so I could imagine what his information theory of aging 
is, uh, but I'm not sure with it. Yeah, so he believes that um, the epigenome becomes corrupted over time, but he believes that the cell somehow is a backup somewhere, and you can revert the, uh, the epigenome back, you know, back to a previous state of methylation, and literally roll back time biologically. In fact, there was a paper um, where they did this with uh, the eyes of a mouse. That makes a lot of sense to me. But the way the way I have thought about it actually is from a um, the perspective again, going more back to kind of information theory and complexity theory, is you know, the, one of the problems that I had a decade or more ago when they everybody said that once we decode the human genome, you know, health care would be solved. Is is that when I thought about the amount of information contained in the human genome versus the amount of information it takes to express our biological state, you know, it's about, there's about a 10 to the 20th difference in, in terms of the number of bits required to describe it. And so when I tried to reason about, well, where does this extra complexity come from? Um, to me, what it meant is that the act of living our lives, there's more information that's actually accumulated or chaos that's incorporated, depending on how you look at it, um, in the act of living our lives, than there is actually in our genome. And I think the epigenome or, or methylation is potentially one of these sources of their accumulations of complexity and actually information. In some ways, it has a history of everything that our body has been exposed to. Uh, and so I think that that would make that would makes a lot of uh, intuitive sense to me based on this idea. But that's also why I think that measuring changes is so critical to understanding our current health and potential future health. I think our genes are very useful in understanding our risks and you know what might be the best way to influence our trajectory. But but just as a thought experiment, for example, like let's say an alien civilization came down to us and said, hey, "You have I'm I have two technologies that are going to appear magical to you, and you can choose which one you want. I can tell you what the entire human genome means and decode it for you." Or I can give you the ability to take a snapshot of a person's biological state instantaneously and non-invasively um, into pure digital information. It's like, wh which one would you prefer? And the answer to me is actually to take the snapshot. And part of the reason is that I think by understanding, you know, if you can take those measurements and measure like the, in the evolution of, let's say, a, a human, you can actually infer and decode, that's the way you would actually end up having to decode the genome anyways, right? Not only is I think it more immediately useful for understanding somebody's health because, but I also think that it actually inevitably is the tool that you need to have in order to decode the genome for the most part. And so I think that just is... Uh, and what do you mean by we've not decoded the genome? Just well, to be we don't clear know. For we don't, people, because that might not be so immediately so evident we can, to most So we people. can sequence it. To, well, and we can even debate that. Like, again, like... Um, I'm not an expert in genetics, but one of the issues that I currently have with genetic technology is the idea of a reference genome. So again, as a, as a physicist, I would much prefer if all sequencing was de novo and, and, I, and that might, at least until we perfect kind of the, the, the high throughput stuff, but in terms of reproducibility and, and, and not being dependent on other, other kind of so-called references, which may or not be relevant to everybody. When I say decode, I mean, it's one thing to sequence a genome, and let's just assume we can do that accurately. It's another thing to know what it all means. And we're not even close to that. But my point is, is that even if we had that, I don't know that it's immediately more useful than our ability to instantaneously take a snapshot of our biology cheaply and non-invasively. I, I understand. So what you're saying in technical terms overall is we don't know shit today. In technical terms. Yeah. I, I think, you know, I don't, I think that sounds again, like I don't want to, um, that I, it, it sounds a little bit like, you know, our, our doctors have failed us or clinical research has failed us. I, I don't think that's necessarily what it is. I just think that if you go back even 20 or 30 years, the tools that were available to actually study biology were not that much different than a, like a psychologist had. Right. And it was very much just based on look, feel, and description of symptoms. Yeah, but you're talking ma of an order of magnitudes way ahead. You can't even comprehend the present 
to where you're pointing to? Yeah, I'm just I'm, I'm all I'm saying is that I just think that I I just don't think that it's necessarily when we say we don't know shit is like well, you know. I meant as humanity. Yeah, 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 yeah. As a, I think know, we have a lot to yeah. learn, and 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 the other thing and thing that's very difficult about it is that the difficult thing about the human body again is it's, um, you know, it's there's kind of there's a notion of different levels of chaos in a system, right? There's class one and class two. For example, predicting the weather, it, it's a it's a class one chaotic system, right? And that just means that our predictions about it don't influence its outcome. Humans are much more complicated in that sense is because my predictions, potentially, if I tell you you're at risk for a heart attack and you should adjust, um, you know, your diet, your life, um, and then you never have a heart attack, there's always, you can never prove that it was based because of the things I told you to do. No, and 40% of people who leave the doctor, no matter what they do, if they take the pill or don't take the pill, would get better anyway. Yeah. I mean, there's... And again, this just goes back to, I think we have to treat each human and their, and their bodies and their health like a unique system and come up with a way of practicing healthcare that treats each person unique. And, and if we do, I think it actually scales much better because all this talk about precision medicine and personalized medicine, at the end of the day, the really the reason that's important is, is because healthcare is such a long tail phenomenon and we need to personalize it to scale prevention. The same way Google, Google has to personalize the search results to get the most relevance, right? And so I think there's, the end goal shouldn't be personalized medicine or precision medicine. The end goal should be getting to like more proactive or preventive medicine. And the way you do that at scale is that it has to be personalized. Going to be interesting how you, you, you speak of interfacing with doctors and providing them with a tool, but actually what you're doing is you're enabling a marketplace so that given so that people can go ahead and purchase like anti-aging therapeutics and procedures or compounds and so forth what you're doing is enabling a marketplace with that data i mean that's what has to happen you i think i think you could and i think that that's in uh, that's a possible future i think it's super important that uh you know one of the most important parts of this is how we protect this data and how people and, and i feel extremely strongly that this data should be owned and controlled by an individual and um, and that, you know, if a person wants to share this information either on a continuous basis and an anonymized continuous basis with some, uh, with academics so they continually research or upon their death, I think it's, that's a, almost has to be written into, uh, I think, our fundamental like constitution that people own and control information about their body. Yeah. So the idea of marketplace, I think, would be okay as long as we establish, uh, you know, I, I do think there's a, a whole economy where you could imagine people being able to deliver on demand. If I, if I have the access to this information about your body, I could synthesize a drug specifically targeted to help you and then ship it to you. And, you know, that's definitely a good thing if you can do it Absolutely. in a way that protects the safety of the individual. Um, and um, But it's obviously... The, the, I mean, that would obviously be great, I think, economically, if you could do that safely. Or the ultimate nutraceutical, there's, there's a, there's, rather than a drug. Well, I think there's other, I think there's other um, especially given the current situation, I think there's actually other uh, really interesting applications. Like, there's ways you could, if you built this data set and it was somewhat standardized, you could imagine without having to share personal identifying information, the CDC actually having access to population level analytics of changes in the population, right? Imagine if, if you were doing this as a standard, let's think about the Flint, Michigan case, right? If you were doing this uh, and you made this kind of, you had these car washes for your body and everybody went and in 20 minutes, everything could measure the body and they went home and they just got an alert if they needed to talk to a doctor. Like imagine that was the, the reality. Well, in Flint, Michigan on any given day, let's say it's a Wednesday, X people would get this done. You could easily imagine just very simple alerting systems or database triggers for the most part. If you saw from Wednesday to Thursday, all of a sudden everybody that came in had increased lead in their body, your immediate response would be, okay, well, something changed in the environment. Like what happened? It wouldn't be two years later when you know people were finding that their kids had disabilities and they had long-term exposure to lead. 
you would actually be able to say, okay, something in the environment is changing because we're seeing in- increased toxins at this specific point in time, right? It, Absolutely. And, and so, because because at the end of the day, as as you know, as people, we're out, we're kind of effectively environmental sensors going around picking up things. You can imagine ways that this could be used to benefit population health and give early warning signs, and also, in you know, uh, prevent corporations or you know tyrannical governments from doing things to our environment unbeknownst to us, you know, because we'd get we'd get notification. But this is that that's a specific case of Flint, Michigan, of lead being put into the water, but. You could also imagine in the outbreak of a novel disease. You know, if this is like if if like if some percentage of people all of a sudden, if some doctors started to see some percentage of people started to have these flu-like aggressive flu-like symptoms, you immediately could say, well, are we seeing this anywhere else in the world in the population? And you could triage much more effectively, even if we didn't have a test for that specific thing yet. We would be measuring a statistical change in the symptoms that were reported. Um, very early it makes on. the present situation seem even more ridiculous. I mean, with well, I, I think that's right. It's like people talk about how expensive it would be, might be to do this, and I actually, you know, we can talk about. I actually think that what we're doing right now um, could be very commodity in just a couple of years, and only take twenty minutes. What we do in sixty minutes. Um, what is the cost of a uncontrolled pandemic when the economy shuts down for a year or more? Right. Well, like what is the cost of all of the procedures or drugs that we give to people um, that were unnecessary because doctors didn't have enough prior information to know that the thing that they were about to do like wouldn't change anything? Right. I know you've got a hard stop. So can I just give you a few quick uh, questions? Feel free sure. to rapid fire sure. them. You you mentioned prior, you know a, a physical, but then people's minds will look at forward or. Um, parsley health. Do you want to quickly differentiate yourself from that type of category? Sure. I actually think we're very complementary. Like the, the, if you look at the amount of information that they gather versus actually a standard visit to, to a doctor, it's actually not that different. What they really provide is access um, to a, a doctor, whether it's 24 hours a day via chat or you can show up whenever you want. Um, and they all have primary care doctors. They are a, a care provider. We are much more focused on giving better information and making it easier for care providers to understand what's changing in an individual. So we actually have a number of uh, existing people who use our platforms that are also customers of Forward and, and Parsley. And, and so we're, you know, I actually think that we're very complimentary. And so, but their, I think their philosophy is, is um, you know, and we can talk about AI and all these other things, but I think their philosophy really is the key to Preventative care is people need more access to doctors. I think our feeling is that the key to preventative care really is making sure that people who need to talk to doctors get access to doctors because it's impossible for, given the, just the number of doctors in the world, it's impossible for every doctor to, for a doctor to spend four hours with 2,000 people a year. So what that really means to us is rather than increasing the amount of time a doctor spends with each individual, it's how do you shift the distribution so that doctors doesn't spend the same amount of time with every individual? They only spend time with the people that need it. So a doctor might spend four hours a year with a person but that they see, but they only see 10% of the people they actually care for. right? And so I think that's, that's the fundamental difference of, of our approach. It, 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 um, but I think it's actually complementary because they, had, you know, they, have, they have great doctors and they, um, and they provide a lot of in-person interaction. That's not what we're focused. But you're not targeting sick people. There's, there's the use cases for our platform. There are people who have chronic conditions. There are people who are recovering from chronic conditions. We have professional athletes who want to use this to optimize their performance and diet and training. We have people who are about to start taking a, a drug that might have some nasty side effects, and they want to make sure that they can track how that drug is affecting them. There are people who are about to have a major surgery, and they want to see understand if they're fully recovered and their musculature and their symmetry has come back and their inflammation markers have returned to normal after their surgery. So there's also- but you really and, are and the physical of the future uh, as per the, the website claim. You know, I think, I think what we offer really is the simplest way ever. You can almost think of it as like GPS for your health. It's the simplest way to ever to understand where you are and what's changing in your body, right? And I do think that there's a future where when we get sick, we always know why we're going to get why we got sick. It's not a mystery, right? And then it's just a matter of how we fix it. 
but but I but I but I think that the unit, like how we enable the ability for us to provide that kind of visibility, is we've made it cheap enough and fast enough so that and non invasive. So that an individual can, on some regular interval, even if it's in a limited group right now, can measure what's changing. And so in 60 minutes, rather than going, you know, in the same time it would take you to go to the dentist, we can measure everything about your body then rather than just look at your gums. So can you tell me what kind of prices, price points you have, where the locations are? So our first location. And I think we'll finish. Yeah, so, so we opened our first location um, in, in March last year um, in Redwood City. And um, it would, we didn't really do any um, promotion of that. And just, we just kind of opened it up to see what happened and let it grow organically. And it quickly uh, filled, filled up. Um, the initial, uh, I think, audience is very much the people who would maybe are going to us instead of the Mayo Clinic, uh, which, you know, they can spend $25,000 and fly to Minnesota uh, and spend two days there. Or they can go down the street spend an hour. We actually measure more. We aggregate your medical history, do genetics, chemical, structural analysis. And then we let you make it really easy to see what's changing. And we automatically surface the most salient changes to you and your doctor in a shareable dashboard. Um, and, and so I think that that concierge, and that's why I think why Parsley and customers and, and Ford customers are actually um, were complementary is they're effectively uh, concierge practices, and we just give a next level of understanding what's changing your body to those customers. Um, so our price point right now is, you know, for uh, aggregation of your medical history for a year and one exam a year, it's thirty four ninety five, um, and that's primarily because we're we're, we're volume constrained, we're, we're you know capacity constrained. We're going to be opening more facilities, and um, and we expect to actually drive this price down uh, to be well under $1,000 in, in just a couple of years. Um, and that's when I think it starts to get interesting to work with payers uh, and other and systems for specifically uh, specific demographics that are high risk. Um, and, and I think then we'll continue to drive the price down and, um, and then it will open it up to um, even more people. Because I think when we get this, and I think, I, I think when we get this sub $500 and 20 minutes, uh, to measure everything that we are more accurately than we are right now, I think it starts to really be look like the physical of the future. I know I have to let you go, but if I can just keep you for a few more seconds and feel free to answer me r- sure. very rapidly. I've got two 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 questions, and I promise to uh, leave it there. How do you differentiate yourselves with like human longevity with their nuclear service? And second, do you think that following coronavirus there will be more impetus? to come to QBio since it's those who are in less than optimal condition, i.e. high insulin resistance, uh, who are predominantly uh, suffering the worst and have the by far the greatest mortality are those who are in a sick condition. Sure. So, so I'll start with the first one. I think the biggest difference, I, I'm, I'm in general actually a fan of human longevity. I think what you get from them is much more of a research project. There's a lot of things that they that measure that don't really cut our bar for clinical information value or reproducibility, and so we've chosen to focus on things. That if we're going to charge people for it, we want to make sure we're maximizing the clinical information value per unit time, per dollar that they spent. Right. So we want to measure more, faster, cheaper uh, information that a doctor can use. Human longevity is doing whole genome sequencing, metabolomics, and proteomics, um, and so, some other things that I think are it's not clear what their value is yet. Um, and I would even argue that because they can't be reproducibly measured, their longitudinal value is questionable. But you know, if you want to have the latest cutting edge set of measurements and we don't know what they mean, like, and you're willing to pay more and spend four or five hours going through this, then that's good. I think what we're really focused on is how do we do something that can be done at a population scale? It's completely non-invasive, so you don't expose to any radiation. And you know, I know HLI uses CT scanner in their scan, which involves radiation. Um, so this has to, something that we do has to be done. It has to be non-invasive enough that you could do it on a child eventually or a pregnant woman um, and fast enough and cheap enough as well. And so, that, and so that's where we're really focused. And so we have technology that allows us to do measure much more as far as clinical information is concerned at a cheaper price faster than they can. And we're also focused on the tools that allow a doctor to find the most information 
uh, or the most important information fast. Because we expect to continue to measure more cheaper and faster, which means the doctor's tools actually need to get smarter in terms of surfacing the most uh, relevant things about your health to them. Um, so, but again, like I think that, and you know, and they started, if you, they, their, their background really is much more of a research institute um, and trying to decode the human genome. We do a, a much more focused panel uh, of 157 genes that have very widespread clinical acceptance and understand what they mean. It's not to say that there aren't going to be more in the future. We'll add them as we think it's appropriate. We just don't want to charge people for information that their doctors can't use and that they don't, they can't use right now. So we're not, if we, if we measure, uh, if we're to have a research biomarker in a protocol, we don't charge somebody for it or we wouldn't because we want to study it. Uh, and because it's just not ready for prime time. And that's why we have do studies. But, um, as far as the, the latter, I think, I think it's. I think that's an open question uh, as we're getting to the coronavirus. It certainly hasn't affected uh, us yet uh, too much, um, but we're also not um, everywhere. You know, we, we, you know, we're in the process of opening a number of locations around the country um, where we have wait lists. But so it's. I don't know that we have enough data to know, but it's certainly an interesting question. But uh, you know, again, I think that if you think about take a step back and think about really what we've built in trying to build the first platform that was really optimized for measuring clinical changes in the human body. It goes beyond just finding disease. If you think about, you know, it goes for understanding how doctors, uh, when they intervene, if it was successful or not, or if they prescribe you a drug, if it's having any negative side effects. It's just this fundamental idea of, can I understand how my behavior or a doctor's interventions change me and affect my health trajectory, and and um, and 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 so I think that that is much bigger than just early identification of disease. It's much more holistically helping us understand and how we manage our bodies and health. And in Corona, do you think it will be a driver of people getting more proactive instead of passive? It's hard. I think it's hard to say. I would be to some degree. I would be surprised if it if it was. Um, I think that, um, but I, but I also know that there's, uh, there's a lot of people who have told me that they expect it to be created a huge surge in demand, but, um, but I think it's, it, it remains to be seen. I think that it depends. It really depends on, um, it really depends on how, uh, scared people are, um, and, I think the other aspect of it is how actionable the information we could provide is. Ultimately, I think as far as coronavirus is concerned, if people really, if their fear is related to coronavirus, the only thing that's going to persuade them is a test for the coronavirus. If this creates a general... But you want to protect yourself against future pandemics and they're coming up more and more. Yeah, well, I mean... Sir, I, I mean, I, coronaviruses I, are... Look, the, the, look the way I see when I when, when I... One of the first customers and people I built this platform for was me after a health incident that I had and where I spent a bunch of months in a hospital bed in 2008. Um, and the way I look at it is this when it comes to our platform. 100% of us at some point in our life will get severely sick or hurt. The question is, is when that day happens, what tools will doctor ha doctors have to understand what has changed recently so that they can correlate those changes and identify what the problem is. And, and that's actually when time is of the essence. And that's part of the human condition. 100% of us are going to face this issue. And so I really look at this as um, preparing for something that's absolutely inevitable and wanting to make sure doctors can as quickly as figure out when time is really of the essence, right? If you figure out what's wrong in a week's versus months, that, 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 that could be a massive difference in outcomes. And, and that's really what I... Um, and so... When you think about it from, in, from in that, in that perspective, when if there's a new pandemic and we don't even know how to identify or test for it, if we know what changes it causes in your body, sure, it's great if I can just go back in for my routine physical and see, hey, are the changes that have occurred in my body consistent with symptoms or issues that people are reporting that have confirmed to have this issue, virus? Um, and so it's an indirect way to identify. And I think that that's, that is a potential, uh, um, potentially useful thing. Jeff, it's been absolutely fantastic uh, talking with you. I greatly appreciate you sharing uh, your vision or the QBio vision. 
I don't want to keep you any longer. I feel guilty enough how it is. I greatly appreciate it and I no super hope you're going to be it's back. It's a lot of fun. I'm looking forward to doing it again. Take care. For more information, please see hyperwellbeing.com or follow Twitter at hyperwellbeing.com.